Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Drought Town Hall. I'm Assemblymember Mark Berman, and I represent the 24th District in the California State Assembly, which includes Southern San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County. This past fall and winter, there were two important pieces of information I would neurotically check multiple times a day, COVID numbers and the weather forecast. I was checking for rain that seemed to never drop, and when it did rain, it was never as much as forecast and not nearly as much as we needed. This has been the case for a couple of years now, so it's no surprise that we now find ourselves in a severe drought. I know that we all feel a sense of disaster fatigue, so I wanna commend everyone who is here tonight. After 15 months of making personal sacrifices for the collective good because of COVID, it's heartwarming to know we're all willing to make more sacrifices for the common good when it comes to using less water more efficiently. Your relentless capacity for caring about our community and our environment never ceases to amaze me. As our neighbors to the north experience deadly record-breaking heat this week, it is clear that this is going to be a hard summer. Climate change is here. It is impacting our lives in a very real way, and it is not going to get better unless we do something about it. Wildfires, ground subsidence, dried up creeks and lakes, and devastation to plants and wildlife are just a few of the impacts of drought. Drought also threatens our vital agricultural industry. California produces over half the country's fruits, vegetables, and yes, nuts. Drought can lead to dry wells, water shortages, affected water quality, and other health impacts, including diminished air quality. When it comes to our environment, and especially water, everything is connected. As you will hear in the panelists' presentations, California's water ecosystem means that drought in other parts of the state leads to drought here because Silicon Valley is dependent on importing water from elsewhere. The good news is that at least some of our fate is in our own hands and there are real tangible things that all of us can do. On Monday, the legislature passed a budget that invests $3 billion in, water, in a water resilience and drought package to expand and protect water supplies across the state. We are also investing record levels of funding in wildfire mitigation efforts, which are already being put to use up north in the lava fire. In fact, I was with colleagues up north in McLeod, very near the lava fire, for a forestry tour just a month or so ago. Of course, we're no strangers to drought. Four years ago, we were steadfast and creative with water conservation, and we all can do that again. We're all counting on each other. Throughout our town hall, I will read out some of the water conservation tips that viewers submitted in advance. If you have other suggestions, please add them in the Facebook or YouTube comments. Our first suggestion comes from Dina Hill in Palo Alto. She says, I keep a bowl in the sink to collect water when I wash my hands. I use that water to soap up my dishes when I wash them. Then I turn the water on very low to rinse and let the water run into the same bowl. When I'm done washing the dishes, I use the full bowl of water to clean the sink and run the garbage disposal. Those are some smart ideas in there. There are some smart ideas in there. Thank you, Dina. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Janine Jones, who is the Interstate Resources Manager with the California Department of Water Resources. She also holds the title of Drought Manager, which is very appropriate these days. Thank you so much for joining us, Janine. Thank you, Assemblyman. And I'm delighted for the invitation to um, talk to this audience tonight. And I'll go ahead and start my slides now. And uh, we will hear about drought from the statewide perspective. Uh, so beginning with uh, the obvious fact that we are now in a proclaimed drought emergency covering 41 of the state's counties. So the first emergency proclamation was issued in April, covering just Sonoma and Mendocino counties. And following that, we had the expansion of that proclamation in May to respond to the impacts of um, reduced runoff from our large watersheds in the Sierra Nevada. And it's not just a state drought emergency, but about 10 of the state's counties have proclaimed emergencies at the county level, and several tribes have already issued emergency proclamations as well. 
And additionally, all of the state is covered by USDA's county drought disaster designations, which are intended to make um, assistance rapidly available to agricultural producers. So this is a second dry year for us, but what about last water year, water year 2020? Water year 2020 ranks as the 13th driest in terms of statewide precipitation and the fifth driest in terms of statewide runoff. And here on this graphic of percent of average precipitation for the water year, you see that uh, dryness, meaning the red areas, are particularly concentrated in Northern California. Although because Northern California is the, uh, where the majority of the state's water supply comes from, precipitation there substantially um, amounts to the statewide total. So that was last water year. What about this water year? Well, California is almost entirely a red state this year. And much of the state's uh, area has received about half of average annual precipitation to date. The water year will end on September 30th, and then we can come up with the exact total for the year at a statewide level. But clearly, this is going to be a very dry year. And of course, we see that reflected in runoff in our major watersheds in the Sierra Nevada. These watersheds serve not just the Central Valley, but water from the Central Valley is, for example, exported to the Bay Area through the uh, facilities of city, of city and County of San Francisco, East Bay Municipal Utility District, and our own state water project, as well as uh, contributing to water that is sent south to Southern California. And what we see here in this graphic is that many of our uh, major Sierra Nevada watersheds are experiencing flows now that are about what we saw in 2014 and 2015, which were the driest years of our last drought. And I think many of us certainly remember those very dry water years. And of course, if we aren't getting as much runoff as we would like, this is reflected in reservoir storage. So statewide reservoir storage has obviously been dropping because of dry conditions, about 64% of average statewide. But if we look at some of the individual reservoirs, such as the large Central Valley Project reservoirs and State Water Project reservoirs, and both the Central Valley Project and State Water Project serve water to uh, parts of Santa Clara County, uh, we see that our large, those large reservoirs are even below the statewide average, reflecting how dry conditions in the northern part of the state have been in the last couple of years. And it's also important to recognize that in this century, we have seen largely dry conditions. Uh, as you recall, we had a drought in 2007 to 2009, and again in 2012 to 2016, with only a relatively short break until our current dryness started. And just to give you a perspective of how this looks at a statewide uh, level, 1977 is our driest year of record in terms of statewide runoff. The provisional ranking for last water year is fifth place. And I mentioned our two very dry years of 2014 and 2015 in the uh, last drought. And when water year 2021 ranks up, uh, we will probably be uh, in fifth place or above, which is not where we would really like to be. Also important to point out that we are continuing to experience very warm and dry conditions out actually throughout this century. In fact, in the last drought, we uh, hit the record for our uh, driest and, uh, excuse me, warmest and second warmest year in terms of statewide temperature. And, you know, so far through May, uh, you know, we're, we're still in the pretty warm territory for this calendar year. Uh, many state response actions occurring because of the drought. One of them, for example, being our construction of, of a temporary emergency salinity barrier in the Delta to preserve upstream storage and better manage salinity in the Delta, which uh, reflects uh, trying to make Delta water quality as um, good as possible for everyone in very dry circumstance. Our sister state agency, the State Water Resources Control Board, 
has been taking a number of expedited actions to um, administer water rights in this very dry year. And because of the uh, generosity of the legislature with respect to this uh, budget for now the new fiscal year, July 1st is the first day of the state, new state fiscal year, we have some new financial assistance programs for water agencies to respond to drought. I do also want to point out that we at DWR have a very extensive collection of groundwater data available related to the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And if anyone is interested in how groundwater levels are doing in their area, you can find information about that on our website. Uh, you know, this isn't, obviously this isn't our first rodeo with respect to drought. We have a good idea of the kinds of impacts that will be experienced regarding managed water systems. It's primarily the very small water systems with a few hundred connections and an unmanaged system, meaning the natural environment, wildfire. And since we are obviously in the summer months when wildfire risk is increasing, I would just like to point out that in the last um, 10, 15 years, we have been continuously setting records for new kinds of wildfire uh, metrics, whether dollar value of damages or acreage burned, as we saw as recently as last year. So for those of you who live in a wildland interface area, it, we encourage you to be very conscious of the risks involved and follow the safety procedures that CAL FIRE recommends on their website. And just lastly, what about next, the coming water year? Um, because as we know, you know, we're managing in this year, but we're also very concerned about the possibility of a third dry year because we know that the impacts of dry prior conditions and warm temperatures will uh, reduce the amount of runoff that we get for any given quantity of precipitation. So now this is where I wrap it up and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. That's that's fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Janine, for kind of laying the uh, you know laying the the ground for exactly where we are, uh, where we've been, where we are, and I, I have no doubt that a lot of constituents will avail themselves of a lot of the data uh, that's available on different state websites to do their own uh, kind of analyses and and look at what's going on. Uh, before we go to our next speaker, I wanted to share another water conservation tip. Martin Rosenblum from Menlo Park and Heather Latanzi from Los Altos both suggested getting rid of lawns in favor of trees and drip irrigation. I love it. Uh, we, we, we've done it. Uh, and it's a, it's a great idea. Thank you so much to Heather and Martin. The next speaker up is Vice Chair Gary Kremen from Valley Water. Thanks so much for being here today, Gary. Yeah, thank you, assembly person, and thank your staff for setting this all out. My name is Gary Kremen. Yeah, I'm the vice chair of Valley Water, also known as the Santa Clara Valley Water District. We're responsible for water on the Santa Clara side of the border. So um, before I get into this, um, we are in an extreme drought, and I'm kind of here today to tell you, you know, what we can do about it. Um, if anyone here is a student of California literature, uh, 1952, uh, John Steinbeck in East Eden talk said that it never failed during the dry years, people forget the rich years. And during the wet years, they lose all memories of the dry years. And it always was that way. And I'll tell you, if you look at the data, it's actually like that. When uh, it's raining out, people forget to conserve and then uh, vice versa. So. Why don't we go on to this slide too? I'll tell you a little bit about what Valley Water does. Uh, next slide. So we, we do three things um, for you. We bring the 2 million people of Santa Clara County clean, safe, affordable water. We also protect you against floods, kind of like San Fresquito Creek, which flooded in 1998. Folks in East Palo Alto had to be rescued off their roof. And we also are sure that the creeks are in good shape. So. Um, why don't we go on to the next slide? So why don't we talk, we talked about um, where's water used in California? Everyone asks this question. Well, of the water that we can grab at or harvest, as they say, 50% um, goes to the environment, to the fish. Of the remaining 50%, 40% goes to agriculture and 10% goes to municipal and industrial uses. So we've been, we've been fighting over this in California since you know, the gold rush days and misquoting Mark Twain about, you know, whiskey's for drinking, but water's for fighting over. 
Um, that's true. Um, you know, most of our water is in the far north part of uh, California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Yes, there's some in the Colorado River, but a lot of it's imported in and aqueducts. If you've ever driven down uh, I-5, uh, that's how it gets south. And unfortunately in Santa Clara County, we're on that side of the plumbing. So when people uh, complain about Southern California, unfortunately you shut them off, you shut us off too. So um, the system that we have in our county was built for 10 million people or it, the state, it was built for 10 million people. Now we got four times as many and we didn't allocate water for the environment. So that's one of the reasons why we're trying to upgrade the infrastructure. Why don't we go on to the next slide? So we talked about California wide where water is used, but how do we use it here? You know, in, in the two counties, it's basically the same in San Mateo and Santa Clara, other than we have a little bit more agriculture in the south of uh, Santa Clara County. Well, as you can see, 55% uh, of it's used by residents, um, and that's the vast majority in businesses. So those are people who can change uh, behavior pretty quickly. And if you think of you right now, well, indoor, we always talk about outdoor, but where does it use indoor? Well, here's, here's the breakdown. And people talk about shower less or shower with someone. Well, that can move the needle 20% of the time. And, and you see it up there. It's pretty clear. But the good news is you can actually do something about both indoor and outdoor. So why don't we go on to the kind of next step and talk about where we get our water from. And it's kind of show you where the problem is. So every county is different. A lot of cities are different. Like for example, Mountain View gets half their water from the Hetch Hetchy system, half of it from Valley Water. But in general, 30% of the water comes from the rain, from the sky. We import 50% of our water from the Sierras or Yosemite. And we recycle 5%, um, whether it be the type that's used in plants and cooling towers. And then we also count conservation, which is not exactly a water source, but that's not using water. That's on the demand side. But here's the problem. People ask, well, what's the problem? Number one is um, there's just limited amount of storage of water within the county. It's the aquifer underneath and reservoirs. And in Santa Clara County, uh, half our storage has been emptied for 10 years um, due to seismic reasons. We built this reservoir some time ago, like most water infrastructure built after the New Deal. Well, the seismic um, standards are different today than they used to be. So that so, so there's no water storage. Plus, you just can't take water out of the aquifer. Now, the water we bring into the county, instead of 100% from the state, which is that big aqueduct that when you drive down to LA, only getting 5% of the 100%. And of the federal water, which is the smaller aqueduct, for ag folks, they're giving us zero water. And urban, oh my God, there's a mistake in the slide. It's 25%. They just reduced it to urban uh, users, which is all of you. And there's a rumor that they're going to even reduce it even further. So no vocal storage or very little because you can't pull it out of the groundwater too fast causes subsidence. And there's talk in the Hetch Hetchy system that many of you on the call are part of that uh, due to um, state regulators are cutting it down, something called the Bay Delta Plan in half. And in Santa Clara County, we store some of it in the South, but we can't get it back because there's no one to trade with. And here's another problem we're having. Even if you wanna go out and buy water, we can't, we don't have enough, we, there's none to buy and we can't get it back in the county. And there's less water to recycle and recycled water is very expensive, et cetera. There's social justice issues around it. So why don't we go on to the next slide? I think we've kind of seen this already that we're all in trouble. Drought has come to us and it ain't good. So why don't we go and look at, you know, a lot of people here are from the commercial sector, go on to the next slide. If you look at trying to buy water, and this is even a little bit old, the price of water is four times what it was not that long ago. And the, part of the problem is there's the snowpack it usually where 30% of our water is climate change. We'll talk a little bit more about that. There's nothing really left. I was just up in the Sierras, hardly could find any snow on the ground. The upstream reservoirs above us are at historic lows and what's being there, regulators are holding back for the fish. Um, and that's, you know, depending on where you are, your belief, 
that could be problematic. And even getting it from south to north across the delta are really hard. And combining that with climate change, you know, from where, where things are in the wet to where we are now, the storage, it's it's actually not just problematic, it's horrible situation. And we're really worried, not just this year, but uh, especially next year, kind of the analogy I use is we're in a plane, the engine stopped, we're at 30, we're 36,000 feet, now we're at 30,000. So when do you call an emergency? We think we should be calling it now. And that's what we did. We declared a state of drought, water emergency, and the county followed on. Um, so we're trying to do our best. And the one thing that people can do right now today, and uh, Assemblyman Berman's going to talk a little bit about this, is conservation. It does work. We're not going to be able to conserve our way out of this problem. Some other things are going to have to change. But the good news is we have all sorts of uh, things. You can go to a website and you can get free stuff. Who's against that? Shower heads, things to save. We'll pay you to rip your lawn out. We'll pay you for rain barrels to put them in. Um, cisterns, um, businesses get stuff. Um, so we're trying to give people the carrot to conserve water before, you know, kind of we, the stick. We, we found the, the carrot works better. Um, but this is not just, a, you know, uh, Assemblyman talks about fatigue, disaster fatigue, running out of water, and we're going to see what happens in Marin because they, you know, they're ahead of us. Uh, it's a pretty scary thought. We lose business confidence. People want to move away. Maybe people won't refinance your mortgage because they're worried about the area. So we really want to stress conserve water and that brown is the new green. And I want to really thank you for your time. We're here to serve you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Kremen. I, I consider that the scared straight part of today's program because uh, some of that was was very uh, realistically worrisome. Uh, you know, we we thank you for kind of you know providing that real blunt uh, analysis of of where we currently are, and then also of things that we can do and things that Valley Water. You know, I remember back in the last drought, I I got rebates from Valley Water to install more uh, much more efficient toilets uh in in my condo that i was living in at the time so there's a lot that valley water provides in terms of those carrots uh and really appreciate all the work that you're doing uh for on behalf of us at valley water uh so mary Teresa caprillas from mountain view shared these three suggestions on how she saves water she said it's basic but i turn off the water in the shower while i soap up and again while i shampoo or condition my hair after an initial quick rinse, I also turn off the water while I'm soaping up the dishes, then rinse them with a lower flow of water rather than full blast. Since I lived through the 70s, I use a strategy I learned at that time, flushing the toilet only after it's been used three times, unless it's more than pee. Great tips, Mary Teresa, uh, although I must admit I tried that last one a couple of days ago and my wife didn't really appreciate it. So I'm not sure if we're at that level yet. Uh, but those are a lot of great ideas, uh, and hopefully we don't have to get to some of those uh, conservation tips from the 70s. Our next speaker is Tom Francis, Water Resources Manager for the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, otherwise known as BOSCA, who is managing the agency's drought response. Thank you so much for being here today, Tom. Uh, thank you, Assemblymember Berman. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Uh, again, I'm the Water Resources Manager for Bosca, and uh, hopefully that's showing up. But let's see if I can get that to. Uh, there we go. I got to zoom up here. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, showing up tonight. A drought is certainly in our present, and as we heard from our, our prior speakers, it could be continuing on through next year. So just to give you a heads up about what Bosca is or who we are. We're the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. We're a special district. We were formed about 20 years ago in 2003. We represent 26 water suppliers who have uh, basically their, their service areas in either San Mateo County, Santa Clara County, or Alameda counties. As uh, Director Kremen pointed out, um, some of those in Santa Clara County are served both by Bosca, or excuse me, SFPUC, as well as Valley Water. Um, we represent 1.8 million residents and over 40,000 businesses, so 
you know, a, a vast number of you rely on, on the San Francisco system for your water supply and, and through the system with Bosca. And that's what we share in common is that we, we get our water from the Hetch Hetchy regional water system. Um, many of the agencies in San Mateo rely 100% on Hetch Hetchy water. So just to tell you a little bit about the San Francisco regional water system, uh, most of the supply is, is, is generated up in the Sierras. Uh, for those of you who have been up to Yosemite National Park, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is in the northern part of that park. That's the primary water storage facility. It, it stores a vast amount of water, but there's more than just Hetch Hetchy Reservoir that are part of the system. There's a couple of smaller reservoirs up in the Sierras. And, uh, and then there's a network of tunnels and pipelines that bring that water into the Bay Area over in Alameda County. There's two large reservoirs, Calaveras Reservoir, there's a photo on this slide and San Antonio Reservoir. And then for those of you in San Mateo County listening in tonight, uh, Crystal Springs Reservoir is also part of the San Francisco Regional Water System. So it does meet um, part of our supplies. You've seen this slide on some of the other presentations, pretty much every pre presentation that's come to date here. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on it other than to say that we as water agency professionals look at this slide and, and with a sense of, of urgency and, and, and concern because anytime you see red shades in terms of how California is doing, you know it's a bad thing. We, we are definitely in a drought this year. But the San Francisco regional water system is faring a bit better than the rest of the state. And that's played a role in terms of what the, what the voluntary calls are coming from um, San Francisco for us as residents. So if you recall that, that prior slide I showed Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, normally this time of year, it's almost 100% full. Um, essentially the snow melt would have, would have been completed and it would have been you know, full of water ready to meet our needs. This year, however, it's at, 87% full. Um, if you recall the slide that Janine had showed earlier tonight, uh, a lot of the other state reservoirs, the big ones are, are less than 50% full. So we are doing pretty good this year compared to the rest of the state in terms of our, our primary storage. If you look down at the bottom, if you look at all the rest of the reservoirs in the system, normally that is as at 90% full. Uh, this year we're at this time, we're at about 73% full. So again, the the San Francisco system, the water supply that, that serves most of you is, is doing very well. Although as has had been pointed out, we're not gonna get much rain uh, the rest of the year. We probably won't get any, frankly. And uh, if it's a dry year next year, we won't be starting full. We'll, we'll basically continue to drop in terms of our storage. So just a quick summary in terms of how much rain we have this year compared to the historic average. Uh, the slide off to the left shows upcountry, so that's the Hetch Hetchy area. Normally we get about 36 inches of rain. This year to date we've got 18 inches. I don't expect any rain through the rest of the summer. You can see January was by far the wettest month. We actually had a little bit more rain than normal, but all the rest of the months was, was drastically lower than what we normally get. Uh, snow, snow melt is really the other part of the equation, and, and I'll be talking about that in a second, but uh, if you look at our local rainfalls, you can see that it's pretty much any month of the year has been um, lower this year than average. So not a good year for rain, and that's clearly why we're in a drought. Uh, Janine had actually talked about historically how this current year is faring compared to some historic averages. I like to look at these two slides because they're very interesting. If you look off to the left, it shows the precipitation as compared to some historic years. The solid black line is, is kind of what average we would get on, on a normal year, quote unquote. The solid red line is what we're getting this year, and that's much lower than normal or much lower than average. If you look at that very bottom line, that dotted blue line, that's what was uh, seen in 1977. So this is very close on the Tuolumne to the historic low for the 100 years of records that we keep for Hetch Hetchy. So um, it's, it's drastically a dry year. Um, snowpack is, is off to the right on this slide. If you look, you can see that again, it's sort of faring the same way that the rainfall did. Snowpack is lower than normal. We actually did have a bit more snowfall in, 
in, and this is up country in the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir system. A bit more snow fell in the latter part of January into February, but it melted earlier than normal. So we started seeing snow melt in April. Um, historically, we, we, that, that was about 15 days earlier than normal. And now the bulk of the snow has already melted. So uh, if you will, nature's reservoir is, is about done for us in, in terms of what we're gonna see um, flow into our primary upcountry storages. So again, I mentioned we're doing a bit better in the San Francisco regional water system than the rest of the state. So what we're asking our customers to do at this point in time is to basically do some things voluntarily. Uh, there's no set rationing target currently, it's just to use water wisely. And that's the message that I wanna to convey to all of you tonight. So voluntarily reduce your water use. And I think the tips that assembly member Berman has given to date are, are great tips. And I hope all of you listening in tonight will follow those leads and, and do what you can to lower your water use. Um, every drop that you save this year is just gonna mean there's more storage up in Hetch Hetchy Reservoir for us to use next year. So it, it's a good thing. We need to think about that. We need to stretch our supplies for the following year. Um, summertime is, is really the best time you can save because a lot of water is used outdoors. And so think about lowering the amount of water you use on your lawns. You know, don't water every day. The time of day is really important. Do it during cold, you know, cooler hours or the evening hours. And, uh, and think about uh, programs to take out lawns if you have lawns because there's gonna be some rebate programs that I'll talk about shortly that, that could essentially help offset the cost of putting in drought tolerant plants. So I wanna say we can do this. We've done this as a region before. The most recent drought in 2015, our, our, our customers um, cut their water use significantly. And I have a lot of faith in, in, in everybody here tonight because you're clearly listening in because you wanna do what you can as well. So there are rebate programs that BOSCA offers for our member agencies. And you as a, a resident can visit our website, which is listed on the top of this slide. It's bosca.org. And you can find what your particular water provider offers in terms of rebates. And uh, so you go onto the image there, you can move your mouse over wherever your, your city falls, click it and it will show what rebate programs are available. And there's another part of our site where you can actually register, put in a username and a password, and you'll be able to, to um, stay current in terms of what new conservation programs may be offered um, throughout this year, because there are some new programs and new opportunities to basically get some money back for anything that you would do to, to help save water. A uh, couple of programs that we provide, and, and I know um, Director Kremen from Valley Water, they have similar programs as well as the next speaker from Cal Water, they have similar programs. Rain barrel rebates, you can get up to $200 um, relative to that. Uh, there's some matching from uh, San Mateo County towards that. We have this program that I really want to encourage people to do, which is Lawn Be Gone. That's a great way to reduce your, the amount of water used outside. And, and then there's smart controller programs. So if you have basically uh, sprinkler heads, you can actually get some rebates for a new smart controller that can help regulate how water is applied to your lawns and gardens. Uh, we have a new program. You can use that to get ir irrigation hardware, um, new irrigation hardware that's more water saving sensitive. And so I'd encourage you to look up that as well. We do educational programs. And, and so if you're interested in taking some classes or, or actually um, have a, a need within your own house to, to try to sort of mitigate or manage your water use, there's a home water use report available that you can access. There's school education programs for um, high schoolers and, and basically middle schoolers. And there's um, programs relative to waterways kits that we provide them with. Uh, for just anybody, there's free landscape classes that are provided. We just finished about 12 classes this spring. We're going to hold another host of classes in the late summer, early fall. Um, those are free to attend. You just register through our website. And of course, we sponsor garden tours and we do landscape audits as well. So these are subscription programs. So not every Bosca member agency 
uh, participates, but a good number of them do. So again, I encourage you to visit Bosca's website to see what those opportunities are. And again, all of this is geared towards conservation. All of this is geared towards educating you and, and your neighbors and, and the residents. And, and the goal is to use less water and, and to conserve. And these programs are really important during a drought, but they're always active. So whether or not we're in a normal or wet year or a dry year, I encourage you to do what you can to conserve water. So I'm going to close out just by talking about what we as, as a water agency and our, our water provider, San Francisco, are doing to try to address the fact that, you know, the region is growing. As, as Director Kremen mentioned, there's regulatory pressures to take less water from rivers and streams. And so we need to think about alternative water supply projects. And there are several projects that are under study or are currently actually going into a design stage. So I call it water reuse. A few of them are water recycling. With Daly City, there's a water recycling project. And the, the idea is to expand that so that we can serve some of the cemeteries up in the Colma area. But there's two other projects that would actually, you know, assuming that they move forward and they take several, you know, more than 10 years or so to move forward. But with Crystal Springs Reservoir, we're looking at a purified water project, which would basically take the wastewater that's generated at a couple of the treatment plants that discharge to the bay, um, treat it to the point where it's drinkable. Um, and then mix that into Crystal Springs. So it would be high quality drinking water that would then be mixed in with the Crystal Springs supply and that stretches our supply. Similarly, over in Alameda County, there's, there's a project that's uh, being developed by Alameda County Water District and Union Sanitary District, their wastewater provider. Uh, surface storage projects, uh, Los Vaqueros Reservoir project. It's a big reservoir out in Contra Costa County. Many agencies are partnering on that, including Valley Water. The idea is to expand that reservoir and have a place where we can put supplies during wet years for use in dry. And the Calaveras Reservoir project that San Francisco operates, we're looking at expanding that, adding more storage in that reservoir. Uh, desalination, that's a to be frank with you, that's one of those projects that many environmentalists are concerned about, but there is, as a region, multiple partner agencies are looking at a desalination project that would be right where the Delta empties into the bay, um, in, in, again, in Contra Costa County. And, and if that's successful, then that would produce a reliable supply of drinking water. And then groundwater banking, that's another opportunity. There's uh, a lot of groundwater basins in the Central Valley, and the idea is to take water that's available during wet years and actually use the groundwater uh, basin as storage and, and extract that groundwater during dry years. So there's a lot of opportunities that we're looking at in the future to basically add to our supply mix so that when we have future droughts and we will have future droughts, we have more options in terms of providing water supply. So that concludes my talk tonight and I'm gonna hand it back to um, Assembly Member Berman. Awesome. Th thank you, Tom. And, and thanks for a lot of those great suggestions uh, for water conservation tips that people can use at their own home and uh, different classes that people can take advantage of to, to learn best practices and, and what they can do. Uh, the next water conservation tip, actually, Tom covered a little bit in his presentation. It comes to us from Stephen Godol from Portola Valley. Uh, and Stephen said that he does all his irrigation during hours where evaporation is least likely to occur so as to allow water to go into the soil. So that's definitely something that we can all try to do. Uh, our last expert speaker is Robert Seeley, Regional Community Affairs Specialist with Cal Water, uh, which I will clarify is not a state agency, even if it sounds like one, um, but uh, is a very important uh, uh, partner nonetheless. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rob. Thank you, Assembly Member Berman, and, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be a part of this and speak with the community about this issue and thanks to your staff for uh, all the hard work they did behind the scenes. So just get set up here. All right, so we are California Water Service. My name is Rob Seeley and we are a water retailer. So we are the last people that handle your water before it gets to your home or your business. And I thought I'd start off today by giving you just a little overview of, of where we are in California. So we stretch as far north as Chico, and as far north as Rancho Dominguez, it covers thousands of miles worth of pipes, wells, tens of thousands of hydrants, uh, surface water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants included. And then coming back down to the Bay Area, this would be the region that we serve within the Bay Area in total. 
But within this district, and Assembly District 24, we have Atherton, Menlo Park, Woodside, Rapola Valley, Los Altos Hills, Los Altos, Mountain View, and Sunnydale. I promise I won't just be reading off my slides the whole time, but I thought it was important to let everybody know just where our presence is uh, in this area. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our water source in the area as it pertains to both our districts. We have two within this region, one we call the Los Altos District, and one just slightly north called the Barrett Gulch District. Um, so in the Los Altos District, we get our water from Santa Clara Valley water, as well as we have storage and wells within the vicinity as well. Going north to Barrett Gulch, uh, just about 89% of our water comes from the SFDUC. Well, 11% of it comes from our reservoir and our plant in Atherton. So, as we talked about a little bit earlier in this area, a large impact on restrictions was the Valley Water's mandatory restriction of 15% reduction from consumption in 2019. It was issued about 21 days ago. And, and we have worked internally to figure out how we are going to work with our, our residential and business partners to meet or exceed this goal. And the good news that we felt was is that we've gone through this before and we have proven strategies and tactics that are going to help us get through this and help us meet these goals and, and help us continue to make conservation. It's not something we think about in these dry years, but just as a lifestyle, as a way that we do things in California to make sure we're protecting our resources and protecting the availability of water for everything that we need it for in this state, not just what comes out of our taps. So to give you an idea of, of the effectiveness of the program, I just brought up these, these you know, simple numbers over one year, but in Los Altos, um, in 2019, through our conservation programs, uh, we saved 10 million gallons. And the lifespan of that is exponentially larger. Well, overall through 2011, it goes up to 671 billion gallons of water, which is really significant. And I was trying to find a way to, to put that in perspective where where it's a little easier to, to visualize that. So one household bathtub holds roughly 40 gallons of water. So 1 million gallons of water is roughly 25,000 household bathtubs. And then you go up into the 671 million gallons from 2011, and it's a whole lot of bathtubs. So I will spare you all the comments, but uh, it is significant and, and it's great. And it comes from these programs, these conservation programs that I'm gonna talk about, implementing them and then just being aware. We have very similar uh, statistics from Bear Gulch over that savings, 8 million, and then the lifetime of the going up from 2011 to 745 million gallons. Hey, hey, Rob, hate to interrupt you. I think uh, we, we something's happening with the audio. Do you know if maybe something's blocking the your microphone? It was I don't great. think so. Oh, now it's better. Now it's better. It just, it just needed me to interrupt you. That's all oh, we need to do. Perfect. Thanks. I wish I could say that I came up with this phrase. Uh, hey, hey Rob. Yeah. Now, now it's bad again. I'm not sure what's happening. I, I don't know. Is it good again now that we're, we're talking? Or are we so? Let me see if I uh, try this. I'll just try and restart my mic here. Does that make a difference? It's a little better. Can I speak up? Does that make a difference? Nope, that made it worse. Let's go with that. We'll go with that. And uh, then we'll also make sure that your slides are available. I, we can hear, I can hear it's just a little bit far away. Um, okay. But, oh, my, now my it's perfect. Apologies. Perfect. Hopefully, this will be a decent mix here. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. No problem. So, everyone being a water manager, I wanted to find a way to really illustrate what that looks like when we all do these little things for conservation. And if you look through the month of May here, we start off with the blue line. 2013 in our use and go all the way up to 2021 and you can see just the difference that, that we make there between uh, 550,000 versus about 350,000 and that is just changing our lifestyle it is just making conservation a key part of, of everyday life and it's not the same everywhere but we do see a similar trend no matter where we are All right, this would be their goal, which does have quite the same trend, but we're still coming in under. And as we approach the summer months where people are using more water outside, where, where that becomes more of a factor, we see that number continue to grow and continue to slip to what that 2013 number was. And, and it's important to see those 
it's important to keep working to make those even better. So there was also in 2009 a Senate bill, uh, X7-7, commonly referred to as 20 by 2020, where we had a goal of reducing water using by 20% overall. It was a 2015 goal, which gave us 10% as a goal, and we were proud to say in bare goals, we hit the 10% in 2015 and then went beyond the 20% in 2020. We have a little bit of a different different view of this, but we saw the same thing in Los Altos, where again, we were able not only to hit those goals, but through conservation programs, through education and, and lifestyle, that we were able to find those others again, come in below or above that 20% savings. And, and we were just so happy and, and so proud to be part of that, along with our, our residents and our customers. So people think about the growth in the Bay Area and, and, and do talk about how we're going to deal with water as population grows. I, I wanted to show these because it just shows that with these changes, population growth doesn't necessarily mean more water consumption. We have here the, the Bear Gulch District and their population growth. And you see it's, it's going up on these top two graphs. But you look at the average demand, and this is, uh, this is uh, out, stretched out to 2050. And the average demand is going down despite the fact that the population is growing, is going up. Now, we don't have to hide from it when it doesn't quite look the same in Los Altos. We see that population grow. But at the same time that we see the water demand going up, it's important, important to realize in 2050, the projected demand for water is still below what 2000 was. And that's amazing. It's, it's a great stat to think about and, and a great place to start thinking about what else we might be able to do. So on our website, calwater.com slash conservation, we have a, a huge dedication how you can conserve water, um, everything from changing habits to rebate programs. This is one of the famous ones we talk about a lot. I'm not going to read it, but prohibited use of water. We go through and then we look at all these different things. Some of them may be obvious. Some of them might be ideas that we hadn't really thought about, but we're all there. And, and I encourage people to come in and look at those and just see how maybe one or two of those things on that list might be something that you can make an impact. As conservation continues, uh, we have industry leading conservation programs, rebates with high efficiency, nozzle shower heads, um, sometimes dishwashers. Uh, doing all of those things, high efficiency toilets makes a huge difference, as I showed earlier in the slides, where you look at the collective lifespan of savings on those. And there's just no way to refute how important those are to the program as a long term program to, to keep us all in water through the wet and the dry years. Another tool that we have for people are our online reporting of, of leaks and waters, or uh, leaks of water and, and pipes. And I'll tell you, I walked by my neighbor's house about a month ago and noticed there was a river coming out the side of it. Uh, and he was out of work. I had no way to get a hold of him, but I was able to call the water department, get a hold of them, and, and they came over and shut it down. We made it even easier. You can go onto our website, you can report this. If you see sprinkler heads, water in the right place, you can let us know we're not punitive about it, nor do we need to give out names. But what we do is we reach out and let them know about the conservation programs that we have and what we can do to make things better. Um, we also uh, have conservation kits, free kits that we can send to your house that allow you to do some testing around the home, give you some items, do some literature, and, and figure out where you might be able to conserve water inside and get that little bit of extra savings. So as we look at our old tactics and success, we want to build on that success. And that's what the new tactics. So our smart, our smart landscape tune-up program is a new program where not only do we have sprinkler heads and we look at efficiency and we look at um, some of the, the newer programming modules that allow you, as Tom had said, to, to do some more smart irrigation. Um, we work partnering with other landscape architect companies to actually come out and do that work for you. And we have a program. Um, it, is, it is limited, we have an application, but you can get online, apply for the program, we'll come out and do the assessment, and then it's all free to you to help you get through to this point where we're, we're really seeing that conservation. And outdoors in the summer, we really use a lot of water. This is a great place if you have that kind of yard, you're trying to maintain it, you're trying to maintain it in a smart way to really get that extra bump and, and do your part in all of this. Um, and so I want to conclude by just saying that well, we live in California and we see wet years. And we see dry years. Um, we are here to incentivize, to educate, and encourage, and empower our customers. 
to really get out there and, and save that water and do your part in this. And we're here to help you every step of the way. Uh, again, thank you, Assemblymember Berman, for this opportunity. That's, that's great. Thank you, Rob. And, and thanks to all of your colleagues at Cal Water. Uh, really appreciate all the all the different ideas and suggestions services that you're providing to, to my constituents and, and your customers on how best they can save water. I want to thank all of our speakers. Hopefully folks can stick around and answer a couple of questions that our viewers submitted. We've just got a, a quick six minutes for Q&A, so I'll get right to it. The first questions, uh, the first question I will ask captures the spirit of many of the questions that we received. This one might be best for you, Janine. How much of this, and we, we got a little bit of this earlier from, from uh, Vice Chair Kremen, but how much of the state's water goes to agriculture? Is this water being used efficiently? And are there water wasting crops we should avoid? Many people specifically mentioned concerns about almonds, otherwise known as almonds. Well, uh, so several questions combined in that. And if you look at it at a statewide level in terms of the data that we report for our California water plan, numbers, for example. And of course, water use varies depending on whether it's a dry year, a wet year, or a more average year. But basically, the urban is by far the smallest component. The largest component is agriculture, I mean, is environmental, rather, followed by agriculture. So, you know, if you want to think of it in very round numbers, because it varies from year to year, if you were to say something like 40 plus, 40 plus, a little over 10 plus kind of breakdown, uh, that would be in the ballpark. So uh, when with regard to agriculture, important to note that agricultural water use is a function of many things, not just um, um, you know water availability, but obviously agriculture is a business and the businesses respond to markets. So different crops such as almonds, for example, are uh, favored because the market for them is good and um, frankly, as much as water prices have increased for agriculture in many areas, that also um, plays a role in helping growers decide what crops it's profitable for them to grow. So a combination of uh, markets and water supplies available influence the ag decisions. Thank you uh, for that, Janine. The other uh, more common question that we heard about was related to housing. Some folks asked, how can you justify adding denser housing in California and Silicon Valley, given the increasing threat of drought and that there is not enough water for current users? Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tackle that one. And you know, as, as we heard today, there is enough water for current users, but we all need to use less water more efficiently. I think it's important that we don't let one challenge, the drought, exacerbate an already existing housing crisis by creating a false rationale to stop producing housing especially denser infill housing. Uh, in fact, the Environmental Protection Agency recommends increasing development density as a strategy to minimize regional water quality impacts. And uh, it's important to understand, as we heard today, that landscaping accounts for roughly half of total urban water use in California. Low density development takes an enormous toll on our air, water, and land whereas dense development is less likely to feature sprawling lawns that consume significant portions of the water supply. Now, don't get me wrong, I have no problem with people living in single family homes. I grew up in one, uh, and after two decades of living in apartments and condos, I moved into one a year and a half ago. But when I drive around my district, I see a lot of lush green lawns that aren't getting a lot of use. Uh, and I would sooner see those lawns turn brown than I would use the drought as an excuse not to build desperately needed housing. Let's also remember that the people that need housing are people who work here, including many of the essential workers that we all praised when they risked their lives to keep our communities running during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. They went to work at grocery stores and hospitals, then went back to overcrowded housing where they put their loved ones and communities at risk because they don't live in large houses where they can isolate or quarantine. So I, I don't believe that refusing our neighbors a humane place to live is any sort of strategy to address the drought. Instead, I think we need to focus on smart growth that adapts to climate change and, and use water more efficiently with a lot of the tips that we heard today. Uh, so the next question is, can we expect to see mandates that large pools be covered when not in use to eliminate overnight evaporation or just evaporation when you're not using the pool? I know a lot of people have pools they don't use every day. Uh, does anyone wanna jump in on that question? 
nobody wants to talk about pools. Yeah, I, I, I can Thank say you, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think, you know, certainly if the drought continues um, into next year, you very well will see many different measures that cities or water districts need to take to try to lower the water use. Um, you know, I, I, I guess my comment on pools is certainly during hot summer months, if you're using a lot of water to keep your pool full, you may have a water budget that you have to stick to. So I would say anything that you can do to lower your water use, whether it's to put a, you know, some sort of cover on your pool or, or maybe even think long and hard, you know, should you be filling your pool during a summer month? That's, those are things that you as a, you know, good citizen, as a good water conserver need to think about. Um, and the mandates very well could come next year because we are in a pretty bad drought right now. And if it's a dry year, starting next year, you could see some much more serious um, restrictions of sorts. Appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. So those, uh, unfortunately, are all the questions we have time for tonight. But if you have more questions or tips, please feel free to follow up and send a message through my website. Uh, I know we have many great questions that were submitted. So thank you to everyone who took the time to weigh in. We're also going to create a drought resources page on my website uh, where we can include a lot of the information that was provided tonight um, and, and helpful links uh, so that people can find out, you know, best practices where they can get rebates uh, and, and other helpful information. So we're fortunate to have uh, our state senator, Josh Becker, here today to make a few brief remarks. I uh, really enjoyed working with Senator Becker during his first six months in office and, and my constituents, uh, Senator Becker and my mutual constituents are well represented by his leadership in Sacramento. Uh, Senator, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for your leadership on this, uh, as well as your uh, advice and guidance for me in general in my first uh, six months. I enjoyed having you on, on. We had a town hall on a very related issue a couple of days ago um, that you may have touched on on um, on wildfires and the impact that the drought is having on creating more fuel for wildfires shows how this is uh, all related. So um, I, I appreciate uh, I, I learned a lot uh, here today. Uh, appreciated uh, people's words about uh, conservation and what we can do. And I love your idea of the drought resources. Oh, there's my, <laughs> I just, I love, mine's got, been roaming around. <laughs> yes. I just got back from Sacramento. As you know, you know, I haven't seen my dog fall. Um, so appreciate uh, uh, that. You know, the other observation we have is just, you know, when you look at other countries, you know, Israel, for example, uh, recycles, I think 90% of its water, you know, Spain is about 25%. I think we're at about 2% uh, as a country. And just so, you know, look forward to working with you on water reuse and recycling and how, you know, those are big projects, which are also jobs and uh, how we can work sort of to take the, the fluff out of the system as, as Nusha Jami says, uh, and I look forward to, to working on, um, on, with you on, on solutions uh, that we can add to Sacramento in addition to the, the money that we allocated uh, this week uh, for this issue. So again, thanks for having me. Thanks for your leadership. Uh, on this topic. And thanks to all of our panelists uh, today. That was terrific. Thank, thank you, Senator Becker. And that's a great point. There are a lot of best practices from other parts of the country, other parts of the world uh, that we should be looking to, to see how we can uh, adopt some things that are working elsewhere in climates that are similar to California. Uh, so I, I definitely think we need to take a closer look at, at you know, uh, around the globe. But once again, a huge thank you to our panelists for spending their evening with us. Uh, and thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. I know we've got a, at least a couple hundred uh, constituents sign in or, or, or kind of uh, view in for tonight's presentation. I appreciate your engagement in this issue because we really are all in this together. Lastly, I really want to thank my senior field representative, Isabel LaSalle, uh, who did all of the hard work to put this great event together. And, and you know, whether it's I Isabel or, or other folks on my team, I'd be, I'd be nothing without my team, as Senator Becker well knows. Uh, so I uh, really appreciate all of her hard work. I know that I learned some helpful tips today that I'm going to work to implement in my home and yard. Uh, and this video will be recorded and posted on Facebook and YouTube and my website. If you want to share it, uh, it's 629. We're going to end early. Appreciate everybody taking your time, some time out of your Thursday uh, afternoon, evening, evening, and I hope you have a good night. Thanks so much.